Thank you so much. I do. Wild, wild, but it's I, it's been. Wild. Don't worry about it. So, thank you so much. It's wonderful to listen about West Virginia and North Korea. <laughs> Nobody makes that kind of parallel connection. I know. Don't so tell I, anybody. I never heard like that. That's wonderful. So now we have um, Whitney Sandy. Um, she was here for a master's. Are you doing PhD there? Oh, great! I, I didn't know about that. <laughs> wonderful. So our title is uh, lovely in anonymity. Mina Lewis, Documentation of the Invisible Worker. Please, you are welcome. Some form of bias in how they present information. 
While Stott analyzes documentary writing and nonfiction in books at length, he only briefly addresses, po addresses poetry when he explains the attempts of the members of the WPA Federal Writers Project to document forgotten American life in the form of those society often forgot, such as African Americans, workers, immigrants, and so on. Stott's identification of the 30s as a time period in which the documentary was a popular form of expression immediately precedes Loy's poems, which are identified as written between 1942 and 1949. Loy's poems, then, are located in a climate where do documentary photography had been a popular way in which to record poverty and the invisible worker in America. While Loy's poems do not attempt to offer themselves as non-fictional depictions of what is seen on 3rd Avenue and 14th Street, she nevertheless engages in a similar project to that of the documentary photographer, particularly the photographer of the 30s, to bring to light invisible American lives. The titles themselves work to locate the poems as accounts of a particular place. Many of the documentary photo photographs that Stott includes in his book have straightforward, descriptive titles of what is happening in the photo. For example, On US 66 near Weatherford, Western Oklahoma, um, this one, Interior Detail, West Virginia Coal Miner's House, and um, Main Street Block, Selma, Alabama. Similarly, Lois' two poems, On Third Avenue and Mass Production on 14th Street, describe the content of the poem in a way that places the events as depicting an American city. The poems themselves, then, describe the people traveling these streets. And On Third Avenue, the first part offers a broad depiction of the appearance of the street, with the aforementioned shuffling shadow bodies and downcase countenances. And the second part, Loy zeroes in on two specific images, a woman in a movie ticket booth and people on a trolley. Mass production on 14th Street describes the view of the people engaging in commerce on the street as a whole and focuses at the end on two lovers in particular. Loy also seems to be using similar techniques to documentary photographers in how she frames and juxtaposes image to communicate the invisibility of labor. Alex Goody offers background and analysis of Loy's two poems, noting that these two poems are geographically located in the New York garment district of the early 20th century and explore the labor underpinning the New York economies of shopping and fashion. This context for On Third Avenue, placing it in proximity to Loy's explication of the urban underclass, her critique of commodity culture, and her ex explorations into the spiritual transformations that urban detritus can facilitate, help to foreground the poem's participation in such critiques and transformations. So again, Goody focused specifically on Loy's engagement with holiday, Hollywood, but I'd argue that Loy also engages with forms of still photography. Her message is transmitted not through narrative, but rather through the framing and juxtaposition of specific images. Um, photo after pogrom, which is in the same compass, Excuse me. which is in the same compensations of poverty grouping as on 3rd Avenue and mass production on 14th Street, illustrates Loy's interest in the way in which photography may me mediate and frame images. The only explicit identification of the description as that of a photo is in the title. Within the text of the poem, we are, not, we are offered an image of a dead woman, quote, hacked to utter beauty, oddly by murder. Only with the title do we see that the image is one which has been, to some extent at least, mediated, framed, and presented by a photographer. Goody explains that this poem follows other ekphrastic poems, which Loy wrote to explore the mediated image. Quote, these poems explore the nature and impact of visual representation in different media, from collage, painting, and sculpture, to photography in the poem, Photo After Pogrom. Throughout her career, Loy has expressed interest in the ways in which visual description is represented. Okay, so it's really small. Um, and that's just part of the poem. So in On Third Avenue, Loy self-consciously frames the images in the poem with a division into parts and the repetition of such are the compensations of poverty to see, which I bolded on the PowerPoint. The reader, the reader is cognizant of the manufactured framework of the poem and how it sets up the reality it represents. Additionally, Loy continually uses light to emphasize the images that she wants to be seen. So again, going back to Goody. Goody argues that throughout the poem, light functions not only to highlight, but to write the urban presence. The avenue itself is transformed as the red-lit thoroughfare. The neon signs illuminate faces on the street. A puddle offers the reflected jewelry of a cin cinema frontage. A passing trolley is possessed of brilliancy, and its passengers are seen as luminous busts. The 
faces of the down and outs are picked out by the artificial lights of the city street and present a feature. Lloyd draws attention to light and how it can be used to highlight or even to transform aspects of a scene or image. So much as photography uses light and framing to create an image that transmits the message that the photographer wants. Susan E. Dunn argues that the poem is an examination of the garment industry and the invisible workers whose labor is forgotten. Lloyd does not examine this invisibility through a linear narrative like a movie documentary, excuse me, like a movie documentary or novel might, but rather through the visibility and framing of specific images. The lights that draw attention to certain unidentified faces actually highlight those faces' invisibility by rendering them visible. Because the faces are nondescript and unidentified, <clears throat> they stimulate the reader's imagina imagination even more to ask why they are not described. Um, so mass production on 14th Street, the other poem, is simili similar similarly concerned with mediation and presentation. Uh, the photo includes numerous examples of reflection and of projection. There is um, the first one, a windowed carousel of girls revolving, while idols of style project a chic par paralysis through mirrored opals. In Dunn's analysis of fashion in the poem, she notes the radical separation between worker and product, nature and produce, exhibited in the poem. The poem concentrates on separation, including the separation between reality and the rep representation of that reality. For example, uh, the dress worn by the female lover at the end of the poem is identified as a replica of the dress the mannequin has on, doused in a reservoir of ruby neon, only her buttons are clothespins, the mannequins, harlequins. The dress is a reproduction, one which differs in a tangible way from the original. Reproduction means separation. The poem even offers a depiction of a watcher of what is happening. As a commodious bee, the eye gathers the infinite facets of the unique unlikeness of faces. The eye is not identified as belonging to any one person, even the speaker. Instead, it is presented as a curious, observant watcher representing perhaps the poet, the reader, or even all of the readers collectively represented. This I differs from many of Loy's earlier poems, which included an I, just the letter, speaker. The I is instead disconnected from the images, seemingly a detached observer rather than an involved participant. In this way, it may be like the eye of a camera, observing and recording, but not participating. Though it is not participating, however, does not mean that it does not mediate what is seen. Any image that is mediated, whether through the page, screen, or canvas, is being presented in a certain manner and with a certain bias. Um, going back to Stott, he argues that the prime concern of the 30s documentary was to make the reader or viewer feel, quote, one knows another's life because one feels it. One is informed, one sees, through one's feelings. The practitioners of the documentary genre in the 30s realized, if dimly, the same thing that emotion counted more than fact. In order to make the invisible worker visible, the viewer must not just recognize the workers, but actually feel the emotions of the workers. Um, feeling invisible, forgotten, nameless is evoked immediately in the opening of On Third Avenue. Loy quotes, and the quotation marks are actually in um, the poem, in the first two lines. You should have disappeared years ago. The you is not identified. But the, immediate an so, but the immediate answer, so disappear, uh, associates the reader with disappearing as there seems to be an unwritten, unwritten, I'm sorry. Right. So you disappear on Third Avenue. So Stott identifies addressing a you as a technique used by 30s documentary to exhort, wheedle, beg us to identify, pity, participate. Lloyd's Lloyd's poem invites us to participate in the faceless mob of the poem, to feel as though we, quote, share the heedless incognito of shuffling shadow bodies, animate with frustration. She strengthens such feeling by using not just the visual descriptions, but by evoking the sounds of respiration and the trolley and the feel of the press of, quote, sweat, sweat sculptured cloth. The feeling of the poem is overall depressed, is an overall depressed, downtrodden one, even as there are fleeting moments of beauty evoked in the idea of visual compensations for poverty, such as in the, quote, brilliancy of a trolley loaded with luminous bus. Mass production on 14th Street works to create a feeling of disconnectedness from humanity and desire for capital. 
Um, the opening few lines evince a feeling of constant movement in the repetition of open, ocean, quote, ocean and flower of closing hour, pedestrian ocean. The people in the poem are identified through their association with commerce and capitalism. For example, the two lovers, crushed together, are more focused on the mannequin's dress than on each other. Desire is repeated through the evocation of Eros's Eros produce and carnival. Desire is not for another individual, but rather for goods. One person with a daisy in her hair is identified only as a consumer. In an almost contrary move from on Third Avenue, the reader seems to be asked to identify with the lack in her own, his or her own self, and in his or her forgetfulness of the workers who made this commerce possible through their production of their good, through their production of the goods. Mina Loy may not be a poet engaged directly in documentary poetics, but her purpose in On Third Avenue, mass production in Fourth. 14th Street replicates that of the documentary photography of the 30s, which sought to make the invisible visible and, and to draw attention to America, which included immigrants, blue collar workers, and the homeless, which I used in my introduction when I changed this. Uh, Lloyd's work in the 40s places her in a position to directly and indirectly engage with this visual movement, as does her interest in the impact of visual representation in different types of media. If the utmost purpose of documentary is to evoke feeling, Lloyd demonstrates that poetic form may offer more feeling than even documentary photography through the evocation of all of the different senses. While critics may denounce the impartial, impartiality and mediation that is obvious in representation through poetry, Lloyd consciously draws attention to the artificiality of its construction, indicating that all representation, whether poetic or photographic, is partial to bias. A photographer can use lighting, framing, and even posing to communicate a certain image or message. In this way, documentary may be equal to, po to poetry in its ability to represent reality when the importance is located in the feeling and message that the art evokes, rather than the inherent truthfulness of its representation.